Dance, bonjour. How's it going, Bioneers? Yeah, yeah. Just give me a second here while I pull out my strength. I, uh, I'm so happy to be here with you all today, and I'm just blown away by the people that I've spoken and the incredible vision that they have shared. And it's my great honor to stand here on the stage before you as a Bioneer, as a board member of the Bioneers, um, and also as a campaigner with the Global Climate Organization 350, you know, to introduce our next speaker. Many years ago, at the beginning of the epic, epic Keystone XL fight, uh, I was working for the Indigenous Environmental Network, and we were organizing along the proposed right-of-way of this one of many tar sands pipelines coming out of the controversial tar sands so-called development in northern Korea Dene territory in the province of Alberta, Canada. And we knew that we had to stop this pipeline to Texas that would bring tar sands to tidewater through the Keystone XL. And we started to organize in native communities along the proposed right of way and we started to talk to landowners all the way from Alberta down to Texas, just making relationships. And it got to a point where we had achieved, you know, I think about 13 band council, tribal council resolutions against this proposed pipeline. You know, people standing in solidarity with Cree and Dene people trying to stop the tar sands. And some of these tribal leaders were gonna step up and they were gonna go and get arrested in front of the White House. And we were organizing that civil disobedience. And our next speaker, he gave me a call. He had heard about it. And I answered the call, and you know, and we had a very real and, and human conversation. And he said, you know, I heard about some of these chiefs that are going to go get arrested. I'd like to help support that. And thus began a really powerful collaboration between the Indigenous Environmental Network, frontline communities, and 350.org that led to an incredible victory, pushing the leader of the most powerful military empire on the planet to reject big oil in the name of climate change. <laughs> Bill McKibben is an author and environmentalist who's been awarded all kinds of prizes. He's the founder of 350.org. You know, and what's really beautiful about the creation story of 350 is you got this guy who's been ringing the alarm on climate change. He literally wrote the first book on climate change. You know, and at the College of Middlebury, you know, in the great leadership way that he, you know, continues to exemplify, he partnered with some young people, you know, and they started this project called 350.org. And it's grown and it's changed and it's, you know, the composition of our team has changed, you know, and 350 is doing its best to reflect back the climate justice movement that it believes in, that it wants to see grow into the biggest social movement in the history of mankind, of the five-fingered nation, five-fingered race of people, you know. And so I'm standing here today in a good way because I believe in Bill McKibben, you know. I'm honored to be one of the soldiers of 350 doing the good work on the ground to build this social movement, to help us reconnect to that sacredness of Mother Earth that this young leader who just spoke was talking about to all of you. And in Paris at the COP last year, you know, I stood in the audience at an event that we had organized and Bill got up there and he picked a fight with Exxon, you know? Because Exxon knew, Exxon has known and has been suppressing climate science since the 50s, you know, and them and every other oil major is on notice right now that their time is over. And it's our job to work collectively in an intersectional way from a foundation of radical anti-racism, anti-oppression, and anti-colonialism. And 350 has a small part to play in that, and Bill is certainly one of the loud voices out there doing the good work to lift up those frontline voices, to lift up, you know, the everyday person, that we all have a sacred responsibility in building this global movement, you know, to reconnect humanity back to ecology in a good way. 
And he's doing it by taking risks. He's doing it by believing in young people and working with them in a really powerful way. So I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming Bill McKibben here to the stage of our Bioneers Conference. Brother, thank you. Thank you so much as always. There's nobody on earth that I'd rather work with than Clay. And no place I'd rather be than here. Kenny and Nina, thank you so much as always. I actually really needed to be here. I'm, um, I'm actually, I'm sort of worn out physically and a little bit um, emotionally. I've spent the last few weeks out across the country trying to, to fight Donald Trump. And, <laughs> and there's just, there's something, there's something about the whole process so just getting mixed up in any way with that energy that at a certain point just so my emotions are a little closer to the surface than I'm used to and so I apologize that in advance um, let me just say I, I you know I've been uh, I was sort of trying to think what to say and the the sort of picture in my mind the vision that rising in my mind of our planet uh, is at least the first of them is of lights turning off you know our big beautiful buzzing glorious mysterious cruel interesting planet looked at from a distance some of the lights are starting now to blink out and in the saddest possible ways. Um, the Arctic right now, as of yesterday, was at the, the lowest extent of sea ice that we've ever measured on this date. So that's literally a, a, a light going out, a big white mirror that used to reflect, you know, 80% of the sun's incoming rays, and now it's dark water absorbing that sun. Or or the coral reefs, I was with our crew in the Pacific in the spring, our spring, their autumn this year when that great wave of hot water swept across the Pacific in the Indian Oceans and in a lot of places wiped out 80 and 90% of the coral that's been there since before, well, since as long as anyone can ever know. Um, um, Structures like the Great Barrier Reef, so big you can see them from outer space, but, but going. I was looking at the pictures the other day from the devastation in Haiti when Hurricane Matthew came through 10 days ago. And the city that got wiped out was a city, one of the cities, was a city on that southwest peninsula called Lake Kay. And it stuck in my mind for some reason, and I went back and looked at pictures from, you know, 350.org is organized, we think about 20,000 demonstrations in every country on earth except North Korea. And I, and I, but that one stuck in my mind, in the picture from that town in Haiti. And it was an amazing picture, some young people who'd assembled a big banner, and all it said on it was, this was their message to the world, was, your actions affect us. Um, um, this was three years ago, and, and of course, they're right. Their city's gone now. Um, if those young people aren't dead, then the people they know and love are, you know. Um, I'm glad, so glad that Nina just talked about the activists who've been assassinated all over this planet, because those are lights that go out. And when they go out, well, we don't see as well as we used to. And it's not just individuals. We're now watching species blink out on this planet, chains of creation that stretch back uh, uh, a very great ways and ending in our time. And it's not, as Clay pointed out, as if these lights are just turning off on their own. They're being turned off. When we learned in the last year that 
Exxon, the largest fossil fuel company on earth, knew 40 years ago everything there was to know about climate change, that their scientists had a complete understanding of how fast the planet was going to warm, that they used that to make sure that they would, say, build their own drilling rigs high enough to compensate for the rise in sea level they knew was coming, that they knew all that and that instead they spent tens of millions of dollars helping to persuade everybody that it wasn't happening, and that we shouldn't take it seriously, and that they helped us waste a quarter century, maybe the crucial quarter century, in a completely pointless argument about whether climate change was real or not. Well, that's what's turning the lights off. And it's, I don't even really have words for that. Um, it seems pointless to berate the Exxon. Um, 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 there, there's some depth of cynical thinking there that goes beyond really, I think, most of our power to fully comprehend. But there's another vision, which is of lights starting to blink on too, all over the planet. And some of those lights, light bulbs going on, you know, in the minds of our great engineers. In the last 10 years, the price of a solar panel on this planet's come down 80% because the engineers have done their job. That's the most important economic fact on the planet. It opens up a world of possibilities should we choose to use them. And Lights going on in the minds of visionaries. Down the road from here at Stanford, Mark Jacobson and his team have figured out what it would take in every state in the union and every country on earth to make this world run on renewable energy by 2030 at a price that we could afford. That's, that's a bright light and you begin to see it in some of the places around the world, the few places that have really tried. The Danes last year generated 49% of their power from the wind, which either means that those sly Danes have cornered the world's supply of wind, or it means that they have the political will to take advantage of what the world now offers. In Costa Rica, there were nine or ten months last year when they ran entirely on renewable energy. Uh, across, across much of Africa, East Africa especially right now, where the fossil fuel revolution of the last 200 years meant basically nothing except perhaps a kerosene lamp in your home, now, every day, thousands and thousands and thousands of people's huts and homes are turning solar and turning solar fast. And it's beautiful to watch the lights come on and people able to study and read. And we could do it everywhere, everywhere. So many of those seeds of that new light were planted in this room and at these conferences over the decades. So many of the ideas that we need to move forward and one can look around and be hopeful about those lights going on, but they are not going on fast enough. Not anywhere near fast enough. We're not staying ahead of the darkness at this point. It is, it is overreaching what we can do. 2016 will be the hottest year we've ever measured on the planet, beating the record we set in 2015, beating the record we set in 2014. July and August were not only the hottest months we've ever measured on this planet, the scientists who study the proxy records that go back before thermometers are pretty convinced that July and August were the two hottest months in the history of human civilization. We went past 350 parts per million a long time ago. We went past 400 parts per million this year. In Paris, because of great organizing from lots of people, people, the nations of the world committed to trying to keep the world's temperature from rising no more than a degree and a half centigrade, which was a wonderful target. But in February of this year, we pretty much hit that 1.5 degree barrier. Now, we'll drop back a little bit because our El Nino is fading, but we're really right 
already past the point where we can be. So with these two visions of lights going off and lights going on, it seems to me that our job becomes to light as best we can the flames of resistance. That resistance, that movement, is the only thing that can make the difference. Don't tell the stories we tell each other can't be about the solar panels on our particular roofs or our particular net zero homes or our particular diets or any of that. Those are very, those are very good things, but they're not the thing, okay? Those stories of I have got to be replaced by stories of we um, as fast as ever we can. I, I got to spend much of last year with my great friend and neighbor, Bernie Sanders, off on the campaign trail. And his, his slogan, his slogan was the most beautiful political slogan of my lifetime, not me, us. That's got to be how we think about the world. The thing, the thing we have to do is build a movement large enough and fast enough to fan those flames so that we can light that world. We know now where the lines are drawn. Even a few weeks ago, the, the most powerful new report that came out of a think tank in D.C. called Oil Change International made it clear what the current math on climate was. There is enough carbon in the coal and gas and oil fields already in production to take us past the two degree increase in temperature that we set in Paris as the absolute red line. That means we cannot allow anything new to get built, nothing. No more frack wells, no new coal mines, no more pipelines, none of it. And it is, it is possible to do this. Clay talked about the beginning of that fight about the Keystone Pipeline. And the truth was, when we started, I don't think any of us thought that we were going to win. Um, um, because no one had ever really beaten big oil in a fight like that. The, National Journal, the kind of insider newspaper in D.C., polled its energy experts in the summer of 2011, and 93% of them said that TransCanada would have its permit by the end of that year. But instead, more people went to jail than have gone to jail about anything in this country in a very long time. More people wrote letters in one day to the Senate than in history. More people filed public testimony. More people marched. It shouldn't have taken all that because it was such an obvious boondoggle, but that's what it did take, and in the end, we won, and the victory was not just that we stopped that pipeline, it's that now everything gets fought. There's nothing that comes for free. The head of the American Petroleum, the head of the American Petroleum Institute, gave a speech to his other sort of oil CEO peers last year, and he said, in a tone of great sadness and lament, somehow he said, we have to stop the keystoneization of all our other projects. And <laughs> my sinister little heart gave a leap when I heard him <laughs> say that. We see the fight around divestment that now has gone global all over the world. We see the unbelievable work that people have done to stand down the coal industry uh, over the last seven or eight years. We know now that the thing we have to stand down probably most of all in the next few years is the gas industry and the fight against fracking so intense, so many places, uh, a fight that that great activists have won in places from New York to France to Tasmania to Wales to all over the world, a fight that still goes on even in places like California where leaders should know better. Um, that fight, that movement, that kind of fossil fuel resistance 
is everywhere now, just everywhere. And beautiful and powerful and local and yet just coordinated enough that when great moments arise, we can join together our efforts to celebrate victories or to take on the most iconic and important battles, which right now means that everybody has got to have their eye on those particular campfires on the high plains in the Dakotas. Um, this is, this should come as no surprise to anyone that Standing Rock has turned into this enormous battle because for the last 10 years, indigenous climate activists have been at the absolute forefront of this movement. And so many of them uh, here this weekend, Tom Goldtooth and Dallas Goldtooth and Candy Mossett, and Molina Lubacan Massimo and Ariel Deranger and Clay, and on and on and on and on. These are the people who fought this fight. And now at, now at, uh, at both sides of the border now, you know, in Canada where indigenous climate action is forming and people are getting ready to take on those great pipelines to the West Coast and the East Coast that the Trudeau government keeps talking about building. And now at Standing Rock in this enormous and, and highly, highly crucial battle um, where we have a chance to at least begin to reverse the oldest and ugliest story on this continent, uh, the story where we've ignored and pushed aside and run over the oldest wisdom on this continent, where we've, um, well, look, it's the Army Corps of Engineers that has to grant those permits. The U.S. Army versus Native Americans is a story that's been told for 400 years, and we better change the ending this time around. Um, And in fact, changing the ending, or at least trying to, is, is all I want to talk about here as I close. I've been telling you a story because I'm a writer, a story about well, really the oldest possible story about light coming on and light going off. I mean, that's where the good book begins and so many other of our scriptures and accounts and ideas. I don't know how this story ends. The ending's not written yet. It's possible that the ending is gonna be terrible no matter what we do, because we have waited a very long time to get started and the momentum of physics is enormously strong and when you begin to lose the largest physical features on your Earth, like the ice caps in the Arctic, that is a bad sign, okay? But I am utterly confident that the ending will be less terrible if we fight and I think that some of it will be beautiful. In fact, that it won't be an ending at all, that we have it still within our power to make change enough on this planet that we pass it along, not in as good order as we found it. I'm afraid the chance for that is past, but pass it on at least in a condition that will make it possible for the next generations to go on fighting for it too. And at this point, that's, I think, what we have to aim for. Don't worry too much about the ending and about how it comes out, okay? Just give it what you've got, all that you've got. Thank you.